In this segment, we're going to be discussing the development of systems to manage hazards. I will be the facilitator and your guide through Chapter 3 from the text Job Hazard Analysis, a Guide for Voluntary Compliance Beyond by James Routon and Nathan Crutchfield, published by Butterworth Heinemann. After the operational and hazard risk and hazards data has been identified, the process of determining the types of controls must then begin. In Chapter 3, we have outlined the use of the hierarchy of controls, its selection, benefits, and various limitations. By the end of this discussion, you should be able to define how the JHA process can provide continuous improvement, use the hierarchy of controls, identify some of the core understandings of personal protective equipment and why it is the last choice of control whenever possible, and understand change analysis and where to gather information for it. In Chapter 3, there are three flow charts for consideration. This flow chart will aid you in the evaluation of hazardous conditions. This particular flow chart will aid in the evaluation of procedures from which those hazardous conditions developed. And finally, the defining of the hazard through analysis is covered in this flow chart. All of these are found in Chapter 3. The hierarchy of controls provides a method to rank the potential controls to be evaluated. By using the hierarchy of controls, you develop a tiered approach to the evaluation and reinforcing of your safety system. The hierarchy consists of step one, looking at the hazards and determining whether or not they can be totally eliminated or totally avoided. Can we eliminate this risk and the associated hazards completely? Can we abate the hazard? Can we then limit or reduce the exposure to it by substituting a less hazardous material as we might with chemicals, change our methodology, or reconstruct the task itself? Can we engineer the risk and the associated hazards out of the process, the job itself, and control the hazard by redesigning uh, the operation? The hazards may still exist, but we've got controls in place that may help contain, contain them. We may need administrative methods across the board to advise, warn, train, alert uh, folks of the various hazards that may still exist and how the safety controls are to be used. And last but not least, and the least effective, however much used, is the personal protective equipment the last resort to shield the employee against hazards. Let's make sure we continue to focus on what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to reduce or avoid, eliminate or control risk and hazards. Risk is the combination of frequency of exposure and severity or the potential severity, how bad could a situation become based on the hazard. A hazard is the inherent potential of an action or materials or tools or equipment to, or conditions to do harm. So as we move along uh, in the control mechanism, we're looking at risk, how bad could it be, and how often are we exposed to the various hazards. And hazard, what's the worst thing inherent in that particular item that can do harm? So the first step in any risk control program would be to avoid the risk and the various hazards to the highest degree possible. In other words, if there's no hazard, there's no risk. No risk means we have no loss potential. So step one is let's look at what's causing and creating the hazards. Can we remove them or eliminate them completely? How do we avoid? To abate, how can we reduce the frequency, reduce the severity, and reduce the inherent properties of the item itself that could do harm. Once you've considered whether or not you can eliminate or avoid the hazard and you've abated to the degree possible, the next step is to consider engineering the problem out of the system. Can you design the facility, redesign equipment, look at the process, 
and remove hazards or substitute something with less hazard through design. Can you remove what is feasible to remove and if you cannot it, can you enclose it in some fashion to prevent exposure in a normal operation? Uh, one example of this would be machine guarding where complete enclosure is not feasible the establishing of barriers to prevent exposure to the hazard uh, the, the barrier might be in time and distance, time and space, in order to prevent contact with the hazard. Once engineering and redesign has been accomplished or considered, administrative controls remain. Can you, by administrative means, reduce the duration, frequency, the location of exposure to the hazard? The hazard still remains, but you've modified the surrounding area, the surrounding operation. How do you go about establishing safe work procedures by considering the scope and severity of the hazards? Administrative controls can be clearly identified through the job hazard analysis. The key elements to be managed, training, do people understand the hazards and the controls that should remain in place? Is there a way to get compliance reporting? In other words, if there are issues where people are bypassing the rules, the guidelines, the protocols, how can you get compliance? What kind of direct observation of the actions of people, employees working in and around the hazards need to be put in place so that we don't have what might be called scope drift as we, by human nature, look for easier ways to go about doing things and inadvertently put ourselves at risk. What types of communication, warnings, signs, etc. All of these we see in evidence as we move around uh, various manufacturing plants, industries, that sort of thing. There are attempts to guide and warn people through administrative means. The major weakness of administrative controls is, uh, is that it relies on specific actions and appropriate behavior of the employee, and not just the employee, but management and leadership. Administrative controls are weak in that they do not control the hazard, they just warn of the hazard and establish protocols about dealing with the hazard. After the above items of the hierarchy of control have been considered, the last and least effective method of control is the use of protective equipment. There's a vast array of equipment and clothing that can be used and put on the employee from steel-toed shoes and boots, safety glasses, side shields, goggles, face mask, dust mask, respirators, etc. The nature of the work may prevent the use of engineering, avoidance, or substitution, and this leaves the need for a combination of administrative and personal protective equipment as the primary protection that remains. In our experience, there is a mismatch that can easily occur between the scope and nature of the hazard and the use of the right protective equipment. In the appendix for Chapter 3, we cover a number of areas. For personal protective equipment, there should be a full hazard assessment. There are various guidelines that are necessary for establishing personal protective equipment requirements. The job hazard analysis assessment is essential to assuring that the correct personal protective equipment is put into play. There's training that must be certified and assured. In many cases, uh, personal protective equipment is merely handed out with the assumption made that em employees know how to use it. So we do need training and training development uh, with regards to any form of personal protective equipment. Policies need to be developed. As you can see, a whole array of administrative items are needed in conjunction with the handing out of personal protective equipment. In too many cases, there's an assumption made through tradition that the personal protective equipment that might have been handed out several years ago or, or is being purchased through a, an administrative mechanism, a purchasing um, department, is the correct equipment. So going back, doing the job analysis in a formal manner, then looking at the protective equipment is the better route to follow. That way you're assured that the equipment in use matches with the scope and nature of the hazards that the control was to be 
used for in the first place. Let's touch on change analysis. When anything changes within an organization, and we must admit that much changes on an ongoing basis in any operation, the risk and the hazards within the operation change. Things you might want to consider and take a look around your workplace to see if these things are occurring. Do you see new materials changing or being expanded, the use modified in some fashion? Are you moving operations to an entirely different geographic area? Are you moving into new or leased facilities? Uh, in looking at facilities, is the equipment that's going in new, relocated, modified? Are the processes changing? Are workflows changing? How about tools, materials, chemicals? What about employees, employee turnover? Do you have new management? Is there new staffing coming in? And then is there any reorganizing and restructuring ongoing within the operation? A great number of things go into looking at change analysis, uh, but the intent is for the safety professionals, safety coordinator to be fully aware of change and be able to look into what is going on and what new items are being brought into the workplace. To adapt to change, uh, consider looking at the process map. Look at the old process, the old procedures, the old flow charts versus what's happening in your new operation. Uh, develop a cause and effect diagram. Look at the past changes and the current operation, or i.e. the new one that you've moved into, or the current versus whatever's being proposed. What do you see in the overall diagram that shows a variation or change? The job hazard analysis of the various tasks that are being performed may change. So as things evolve, don't forget the protocols involved in doing each individual task. These must change as well. By comparing the old work environment against the proposed changes, such as environment uh, that is ongoing, you, will, you may find severe differences that must have controls in place, and the hierarch hierarchy of controls will allow you to assess your workplace and the changes that are occurring. Don't forget the administrative side. Look at your old policies, procedures, and protocols versus any new requirements. Compare the current organizational structure with the changes that might be occurring with your new operation or the new entity that uh, might be being developed. What type of employee is going to be there? Are, are there additional employees, a different type of employee, different skill sets, knowledge, and physical capabilities needed? By completing a risk assessment and using process maps and the use of the job hazard analysis, it will go a long way to assessing the workplace and the issues that may be swirling and developing around you. Workplace hazards don't exist in a vacuum, and we must realize constantly that the workplace is a very dynamic place. Things, elements, items are always in some state of change or flux. Not only are physical needs monitored, but the human element is always present and subject to radical change on a day-to-day -day basis. So we must consider the human condition as one of continuous change. You as an effective safety manager must be sensitive to change and all the potential effects on the safety of the workplace and the employees. And in general, keep in mind the use of the hierarchy of controls. As you identify items, it gives you a great map to follow and gives you an indication of where you stand in the general control of things. If you can eliminate something by ceasing and desisting, desisting do so. Um, the last resort is to put protective equipment on folks because then you're into the behavioral side and all the aspects needed to control human nature to the degree possible. This is Nathan Crutchfield, your guide through the job hazard analysis by James Routon and Nathan Crutchfield. The book is available through Amazon Books Online and other online resources. It is by Butterworth Heinemann. For additional information on the safety process, also go to www.emeetingplace.com.